You are now muted.
be fear that they use those. Uh, those to like multiple machines if it needs to be your over and over. Um, so I think it's just so that nowadays it's really not 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 more to try to put this crucial system state on a local disk. A local disk is considered uh, just not very viable or it's it's much harder to manage. So when you have important states, like you know, in, I guess in Jenkins terms, so it would be like a job configuration, the build record, or the order, um, it, it, it just do not, like, it, it's, it's better not to have those on the local disk. So there's a lot of support in this space trying to like make managing Jenkins and its condition and its environment more kosher. So when I like to map those things into some like a coherent top-level picture, I think this is the kind of what we come up with. A number of different facets to this program, so I call them out as different rows. For example, there's this whole space around configuring lines, which of it as a, you know, the what happens between commit and until it hits the way to the production services. There's also a number of coordinated automation activity that happens. I need to be put together in coherent ways, and in Jenkins, it's not always easy. There's what I mentioned earlier around how you deal with lots of lots of like you know different jobs. So you have lots of applications, or maybe doing a microservice extra case, you end up with lots of much small things that all need to be built and deployed in the same way. So there's a lot of repetitiveness in here. There's some things around the configuration. So maybe like if you're already doing the uh, the configuration code paradigm, you might feel uneasy like you're installing plugins manually from plugin manager. So yes, it's set up you can do the one click update, but if you want to like, remember exactly what set of plugins you have at any given point in time. I think that this is indeed helpful. So there's things like that here. And the um data that you have to create like, maybe you can think of it as the like a build record, test reports, artifacts, console logs, and that sort of thing. So it takes the like you know your time. And right now, those things are stored inside things. So that, as I said, like, people are trying to avoid storing things in the local disk. So and then the, uh, the build environment, this is also like a big, like if you're using a Jenkins environment, um, the developers that are using the service expect you to provide this reproducible clean build environment. And a part of those, therefore, is to like, maintain that. Sometimes this is actually the most important part. Um, like when I'm in my own Jenkins cluster at some microsystems, like I have this, all these like, you know, dozens of physical machines that was in the lab, and then I had to, like, well, the same tools available on those and so on, things like that. Nowadays, we can do a little better, but it's still a challenge for many people. So, um, all the kind of like, interesting axes in this space that different people have made some different progresses on. Um, and in sort of things we do with Jenkins today, so I guess this is it yesterday in the sense that this is really stuff that is working today that you know, a number of people are using. That you can you can talk to your office tomorrow and then you can do those stuff. That you can this is the two of those stuff is actually the one that's like going on right now. So in case you didn't know that you are working in the community, we are kind of working hard for the major new grade of Jenkins to do some of those. So there is a number of features that need to be set in this version. And that's the style that you can see in some of these spaces. And then four, this is more of like a thing that I was like on my other. I'm trying to grow more on the inquiry, more people around these efforts. So some of this stuff may not happen. I'm certainly hoping to make this happen. I have some leverage, but at the end of the day, the bulk of this effort is done by the community, and then that is, unless enough people feel like there's that needs to be solved, that doesn't happen. Um, then there's like one green box here. So this is actually something that if I can put my cloud beat hat on, uh, we have like a, you know, this is a big enough space and then we, especially this problem tends to compound in the bigger, like a larger user base that we, like sometimes the cloud beats have some, like I don't know. There's one product that I wanted to talk about, <laughs> it's also the technical aspect of it, I think, because 
they see the address is very nicely. Even if, you know, they open source, like we see it in the open context, so open source field. Try to solve this problem going forward. I think part of it, but it's, you know, it's going to be a, um, a really compelling story uh, that I wanted to touch on. So, sure not, so now I'm trying to go a little deeper into some bits. So the, the first thing is this like a pipeline. Um, the pipeline is called in general. So, so the problem that I guess I'm trying to is try to think about um, is you know you're trying to develop a web app and then the developers are committing changes to source code repositories. And then all is for that changes eventually hit to the production bar. But in any places there tends to be multiple Steps happen in between before things can get deployed to production. So, for example, I have, you know, the, the building and any testing, and after that, you deploy to the staging environment and run some tests. And then a few might come in and say, well, this is ready to push to production and before things go to production, things like that. So that's that's the kind of picture you have. So, um, and that's for starting to do this kind of thing. So uh, we've been doing this since um, we started working. From 2014, um, and then so we kind of get a long way to get this to work well. So the key idea here is today, if you be if you're putting together something like that, that like you might be doing it with um, creating style jobs using like a downstream, upstream trigger. Some of you might know comment right trigger, there's other plugins. A lot of it involves like sticking together lots of independent. Developed plugin, um, which is not very like, which is not very scalable <laughs> cognitively in the sense that you need to know these independent pieces are not particularly developed together well. So nobody has actually thought about that. But like you know, this whole experience when you combine them, the level and error involved. So we come up with some scheme, like a one description mechanism, like a one tool that you can use to, you know, have this kind of Thing. Oh, so like instead of doing this over the UI, it's a text file that you can put into the work control system and keep track of the changes and so on. Um, and then we need to be something that needed, okay, you know, scale well, all the way down from very simple things that you can even you be doing today with a single style project. So it'd be just a build and that maybe you're even doing web apps, right? Um, but only to the most complicated, like a CD pipeline that you could imagine. So in that way, like you, when as your as your automation grows, you can see the same mechanism. You don't have to like jump the ship at some point to get to something else that needs to be like better with the environment or anything like that. So that's the um, that's the key here. So so this is an example of a very trivial pipeline. Okay. So like I know you, you should think of this I know you're saying, well, like I need to run this whole thing inside one of the field agents. Um, and the pipeline has this notion of stages. So stages is just a way of help people understand like roughly speaking the kind of work that needs to happen in the linear order. So then in the studio case you say, well the first thing we're gonna be in is the build stage. We're gonna check out the source code it's gonna get and then run the uh, grade or to they assemble the war file. Um, and we move to the test phase and then do some additional test activities. So that is just as simple as it gets. You're just doing the build and test. But you can imagine um, this could go into all sorts of more interesting things. Testing more lines. So, so this is actually executed as a the DSL on top of Groovy, okay. and then in Jenkins and all of other exports, and some of them are calculated. Are you using Groovy? So it seems like people have some familiarity with it. But at the same time, you know, if you're something like, like a, so my goal is something like this should be like understandable and even writable by somebody who doesn't know anything about Groovy. You could like, read it as a configuration file. Um, so that's also a part of intent. And then so the fact that it's built on top of Groovy is really just 
I got anything on top of the case. But if you have a power user, you could use it to do all sorts of clever stuff. And I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, so, the, uh, so, so this time script has all these steps, what we individually have steps that are extensible. So some of the interesting steps, for example, have, it's called this imp step. So that literally is going to make these execution pauses a moment until somebody, in this case, somebody that belongs to the off team, is coming and say, yes, yes. So, you know, like you want, you can describe the entire automation in this formal manner, but you still want to have some human checks and balances at the key places. So you describe those things. You don't have to, you don't have to exclude humans from the process in doing this. That's a, you know, the fundamental part of the pipeline. You can, or you can do the parallel execution. So in this case, so this is here. So here is the one, some sort of like a chunk of the war where I have two parallel execution branches in the most way, like running two sets of that. So on this branch, I'm I'm asking them to give a new build agent at the level called Linux. So and then run this platform there. And then here, other side of the branch, I'm, like, I'm going to occupy one build agent at the Windows level and then run batch command in there. So you can run, you know, this thing is quite composable. So maybe you need to check out different source trees. So maybe you can have this statement in here. You can do all sorts of you know, the interesting stuff by just combining these. Like that's the, hopefully you can get the idea that what we are trying to do here is we want to create this <coughs> one plugin. Well, almost like a, it's actually a consists of multiple plugins. So maybe I should say like a one subsystem uh, designed so that you can go from something really, really trivial like this as a way to the most complicated stuff. You know, for example, I'm using the hack that is the GBD itself. So you can do this on multi-system variable. Loops, you can define functions, all the things that are possible. Um, and in designing this, so it's like a fairly new, enhanced, like a significant addition to the Jenkins core concept. Right? It's one of the core types that, that, run, that the field that runs parallel to, say, something like a field, which is really the bread and butter of Jenkins today. So in the this system, we wanted to make sure that it, okay, we are solving some of the other long standing problems that the people have been having. So, one of them, for example, is at the loss, the resiliency to the loss of masters and builders. I think, as uh, say, if you have tests of defined as a freestyle job on Jenkins that takes, I don't know, like 15 hours to run, I've heard from some people that their test takes like five to four days to complete. Somebody like that, you know, if the test is like, you know, in progress, and some in the middle, um, to do, let's say, the connection, connectivity to the data, you know, which works is, you know, inherently in level. And unfortunately, like, Jenkins promptly forgets that he was, what he was doing on this machine, and then he's going to consider the entire execution failure, so you have to restart from the beginning. So this is the reason why we, like, Jenkins are learning that to wait until in the Friday night before they can install a new plugin and then restart the engines because there are all sorts of activities that happening that we don't want to track. So um, we wanted to fix that. It's just there, there really isn't no, no, even any reason it has to be this way at, at the fundamental level. Like, so long as the process that is just running on the machine, be able to, like, the engines could go back down and come back up and it could still remember what he was doing on all these build agents. So, um, in three projects, we couldn't really fix this because of the fundamental assumptions that's built into that project site. And so all these plugins have been already developed to really assume that model. But yeah, are adding this new, entire new subsystem that is pipeline, we want to solve that. So the benefit of using the pipeline is whenever you fork off these processes by your <laughs> already command, uh, the batch file, make a BAT command, um, every person that's done is sort of a new way that the Jenkins can come back to it. So you can do Jenkins any time without worrying about losing the of the builds and tests that it's been running. Um, 
and so that's really like a part, like a better feature. And then it and then sort of like a package it in some more sort of like a story that's readily consumable by users. So the pitch that we you can find this kind of pipeline script inside the Jenkins file, which is another file that you put into the source code repository. Uh, and you can teach Jenkins for your, so in this case, you, know, you, you will teach Jenkins your GitHub organization. And the Jenkins should therefore now start monitoring all your repositories and all the branches in the organization. Um, as soon as you commit like a Jenkins file into one of the branches in one of the repositories, Enough of a queue for Jenkins to notice. So you are trying to do some building this front end, and then Jenkins will do everything automatically for you. Change is like a way you interact in face with Jenkins. You don't have to go create new jobs, choose uh, Jenkins UI to get stuff done. You just need to push the new changes in. So uh, we created um, a demo site to show this concept. So let's see here. I created this like a fake company called um, uh, be helpful if my Chrome would come back to life. Um, I created this fake company called Jenkinsync. So this is like a company that's doing some microservice development. Um, I have um I have a few repository that is actually the web app. So that is like a, the, the web app. So um, I won't go into the actual details of what this app does, but it, it is just like a Maven app that I believe I think doing like a one or something like that. So it's a very gel as far as the app is concerned. But where it's interesting is, let's say if you are working on this component, then um, then you just have to create this one. Jenkins file, this specific build instruction, in this case it's microservice. And you wonder, well, what, what, what does microservice mean? Like, you know, you can't, it cannot be possible you have the definition of microservice that works for everyone. And actually that is correct. What it's doing um, is, actually, before I get to explain it, so there's a Jenkins file that, so that's telling Jenkins that there is, um, this, is um, this, this branch needs Build. So that's the way this, this Jenkins thing works is the three branch to serve the staging and production. So um, the tip of those branches are deployed into their respective environments, and then you do the deployment by merging like the branch into staging. So in Java, this might not have people do it. They pick their common for let's say a Ruby or the Node.js app that doesn't involve these compilation steps. So uh, when these files on the Jenkins side, what happens um, is that, like this one looks like a folder that represents a um, represents a, a GitHub organization. And then to set that up, actually, maybe I could um, maybe I could quickly. So all to do um, is, is actually this is a new job type that we are adding in Jenkins to the It's called um, uh, for the uh, GitHub organization. Um, and then here I regret that, not, uh, that I'm not really using the latest uh, beta version of Jenkins, which makes this UI much better. Uh, if I create those, um, all I have to do is specify that, um, specify where my, my GitHub organization is. So that's, what I'm, that's exactly what I'm doing. And anything else that's created in, uh, inside is happening. Once. Um, the because um, I don't know. This is supposed, um, so security. So it, it did have the fact that the security repository had um, had um, the Jenkins in it, and then the code actually recognized that all these three branches had the Jenkins sign it. So if we get, for example, exactly what changes have been landing into the dev repository by looking at this changes. Um, so the, the developers have been busy adding various changes in here, and all synthesized, so you, you see some, some fairly silly ones, but 
um, so mentally picture that people are actually debugging us for that. Um, and then you can also visualize um, these times as multiple stages. Uh, that consists of building and deploying and testing promotion. So those stages that show up. Um, and then uh, as you merge these changes into different stages, uh, it's promoted over immensely keeps the production. All these things that previously require very careful manual configurations and so on, it's not happening or not. So back to actually how does that thing in studio? Like it, I know you have four stages, but like we actually didn't see any of those four stages defined. So what the other thing it's doing, and here is where it gets crucial, is also like in a, in a company like this, you want to standardize the, the way the build happens. So in, in this Jenkins thing, we are doing microservices. Every service should be built and tested the okay. And the process of that should be owned by the release engineer. We don't want the product people, like in a product level for us to be doing its own Jenkins file, like say it's like a pen line of Jenkins file that shows you how in the slide. Now they, um, it's, it's just like it's just not their job to do it. The sweet job that sweet job is that, well it's the job of the release engineering people. So in this thinking think organization, I have a repository for the release engineers. So the release engineers, what we do um, is, um, is to define what that microservice is. Um, is. So the, if you look at this repository, we define this microservice.gruby. is the actual definition. Of the process, uh, you know, this under the um, sorry, how this Chrome is actually like not responding to all right. So the DC engineering team can get the centralized the process. You can find it. Um, it, it, it's exactly what it means when somebody says, "Oh, this policy should be built like a microservice." Like, it gets going into details here, but hopefully, it's still all that. I mean, obviously, people writing this would have to know about things more than, let's say, those product level for us to put that one. But it's in here, like, at the line, it's like it's checking out the source code on the right front, and then you're doing an even build. And it gets to the case, it's a little bit sort of like hackish, but what it's doing is figuring out the name of the report sheet so that I can later use it. It's a very inherent way I'm going to push that into. Um, and there are three branches that you need to worry about. If, if, he, if he's one of those three, like officially best branches, and after building, I'm going to deploy that into the Heroku so that like, we can see them. Um, and then once I deploy those, I'm going to run some tests. And then they, in this case, well, I'm not actually doing the best. But they imagine this being the serial test script that like, hit that endpoint that was just deployed. Um, and once the testing is over, we can go into the promotion stage where they, what the idea that it's trying do is now the Bitcoin that environment is good, so that if we are like a the dev environment, then it's time to more jobs to change it into the staging branch. So and then that is basically comes the promotion into say the staging and from staging to production. So in this case, the process is all automatically, which you know be what you're trying to do. But um, you know, point I guess so that but it's somewhat I think I understandable model and perhaps more importantly the point here is that you get to define this once and every service, every component service in your company is used from the same model and you change this one file then it obviously like changes everything that's defined in the application. So you have the ability to keep things dry. Um, and just to make like this is complete example meta circular this engineering repository defined its, its own Jenkins file and what it does is Check every time I commit a new change, then into the map, I'm going to deploy this definition of the common build process into Jenkins. So, so what this is trying to do is um, like I push the change into Jenkins itself so that when Jenkins sees the uh, definition in this product repository, uh, like the three days that doing um, like a microservices, it knows. Exactly what version of that definition is going to take us. As a lead engineering, what you're doing is also in the version control system. So is there where, where um, Jenkins file is being pulled in? Or you call that? So as a Jenkins master.
answer. It is. So it, it actually, the way it works right now is uh, the, the Jenkins mother has its own Git repository in which you're pushing this into. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that basically constitutes the deployment of the view process. So it's bigger to that pattern where you want to check out. Right, so the exact flow of event that's happening is um, if I make a change to this, to this engine repository, then Jenkins notices that, oh, it's like something. Well, there are changes in here, just like it did notice any changes in any other branch. Okay. And run this, this corresponding Jenkins file in which I push this for your current head into inside the Jenkins. So this, this, is, this is actually a Jenkins endpoint. I'm speaking as a Git server. Yeah. So Jenkins is a, a Git server that you can Repository host. Right, yeah, because it's got the JGIT in it, so it can be the JGIT server protocol. Okay, yeah. got it. This is um, the open source version? Yeah, everything I'm talking, so the, on all, like I gave you that diagram in the first page, the, everything in blue is open source. The only one thing that I'm going to put my Clavis hat on is a green that's in CJP. So, yes, this is all in open source. To get endpoint new with 2.0, or is it already there? So the, Jenkins, the Git endpoint for Jenkins is that that feature has been around for like actually a long time, and various plugins have used it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but see, this is why I'm trying to explain you. So this so right um, um, uh, no, so we we get the whole system extensively. Obviously, like everything we do in Jenkins is done that way. But in terms of available implementation, we, I think we really only done GitHub. And so it's like another, not working on the big packet. And my hope is that well, like two should be a good example. So like if somebody wants to do GitHub, it should be able to do it. On so maybe one of the So that would be cool. Can I ask you about that to go back to your code where you are propagating from one end to another? Okay. It's all like it's happening and why I have to pay that microservices be on. It automatically moves from one environment to another or it's a tab I have to regard individually to your particular environment. Um, no, uh, let's see. Maybe I didn't clarify the question. So, so you did the microservice, right? All yeah. my code is pushing in and all it's calling is the microservice. Right. So it's all Anyway, it's a picture. 
So I have three branches going on, and then margin that's deployment. So every deployment leaves the merge commit in the history. So you track those, you can see exactly when after it was deployed, you can roll back and stuff like that. So that's the general idea. So if I were to try to like, you know, code that into the pipeline script, then this could be high. So, yeah. Um, I don't want to go too much into the particular, the, the very particular uh, CD pipeline here, because I I think the organization does this differently. The main thing that I want like, you guys to take home is that you can codify those things now. Uh, you can keep it in much more dry. I mean, like, you don't have to repeat yourself all that much. And then, uh, One question. So in this right here, um, let's say someone commits something in the dev branch. Yeah. This command there says, it, say, okay, this is dev, so he's going to go in and just if they even say you have here. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of it, it, it runs, it, it, it's not really deploying it anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I'm deploying it to the okay. environment. Okay, so you're deploying yeah. it for the environment. Yeah. And then it passes some tests. <laughs> yeah. I'm sort of doing it, the automatic promotion. Or you're not getting promoted, maybe it's just me. Are you expecting the developer or a person to get it to get promote? Or are you paying the developer is I mean, checking it to the day of rush and then hitting the microservice and it automatically moves? So it's really up to your organization, right? Like, you know, if I, I know some companies, like especially small companies, that, that, that deploy automatically unless, let's say, the chain includes database scheme or something like that. But you can that way. You could choose to promote manually, right? Maybe you don't have to, maybe it's like a more part, and you can still use this with that, like with but people manually, people manually deciding when to do the deployment. Um, so, so let's say the dev branch, you build a snapshot. Yeah. Where do you store that artifact ID? Uh, so in this case, well, I'm actually not storing artifacts. Want to cover other topics. Um, so, um, anyway, so the, the key point that I'm trying to drive home is that you could define those things as code um, and you could manage these changes. So, it definitely helps the like a key less tip in Jenkins. Frankly, doing this really involves a lot of tweaking and then things and making sure that the things are consistent, which is not always capturing during okay. So um, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about um, is the Adobe DSL plugin. So the pipe that I think is new, or new, um, but um, the you know idea that if you're using Jenkins today, there's a lot of things you probably already have, and it might not be you might not be using or ready to. Like, they convert them all that into Python. So the self plugin is something you can use today. Like people have been using this like uh, very extensively for actually quite a long time now. Uh, and then this is really great at like codifying your existing Jenkins setup. Like basically like a hodgepodge of freestyle jobs that's connected together. Uh, translate that into some form of code. So hypothetically, well, like you know, maybe like you uh, you have you have two dozen themes. And each team needs like a freestyle job to run the build and test and deploy and then a QA and then like a release or whatever. And then plastic management jobs to do, to do something they have to like, do that over and over again. And this is something that, that this is the kind of thing Job DSL is really good at. So um, this is like I think much easier to understand if you could actually see it. So that's the plugin. So the general idea here um, is like so this is also a DSL on Groovy. Um, so it's like the the pipeline script one. I thought the DSL driving this is the so, it's just, so here it's defining a new freestyle job. 
of how you give us a um, text report is got from here, then this branch, and then as a main build process, it's going to invoke the Maven job. And uh, um, uh, this is the actual command line option. Then there are some scripts around those. So what, what these are things that they here is basically like, a good example is looking at the GitHub branches. Um, and then for each branch, it's going to create one job. So that's kind of a little bit overlapping with what I was showing earlier with the GitHub organization folder, this particular example. You could imagine like this could be driven from any other data flow or could you know, make a kind of as a function that you could call out or any of that abstraction that you might want to build on. So um, this also has a fairly extensive, if you look at all the things it's capable of doing, so like if you look at the job, um, Everything you can imagine, um, you can configure on the freestyle job, you're, it's ready to configure from here. So we say freestyle job, this could replace the, say, like build shell step, it would be like a Groovy DSL step, and then this goes in there? So it's a little bit more easy, but the way you think about it, it's like, okay, you're, you, it's a field job definition that's doing the actual work. Today you're configuring the freestyle job by going into dry and then clicking and typing. And what the plugin does is to replace that clicking and typing by the code. Every time you run that DSL script, it's going to generate all the jobs, update whatever job definition you have into this canonical definition. So, um, so, so when you take on this plugin, you're saying, like, okay, you're not going to manually touch this job configuration anymore. You're going to let this plugin do it. So from like a monitored repo from some job DSL type? So you need to, so this is where I it was a bit of a crankiness, but to use this, you need to create one job that, that runs the that job DSL script. Okay. And this is one thing you need to be manually manage. Everything else is, you can generate. It has a slightly groovy, different groovy syntax than Jenkins file. So, yes and no. Um, so, there's an effort underway to, obviously, like, we don't want to create like, a two different syntax to do the same thing, right? So, we have to unify this. Uh, so, this is like a git step. Um, and then, so that's actually like a work in progress. We didn't quite make it uh, just yet, but I've been I've talked to the um, the BS plugin developers, and so that's a that's a work in progress. And then, so so now we are trying to do, like manually ensure wherever possible to keep the syntax. And then, course, we are creating these kinds of plugins to say pair these names, these simple names, or the names, so that the both plugin that actually somewhat like These plugins can all use the constant syntax. So, work in progress. Um, so that's the job DSO plugin. Um, so like I said, okay, what, what we often need is like using the, like early on, like obviously the type is more complex. You need to see Jenkins. So you'd much rather actually click and type than figuring out the code. But so as you said, grow at some point into like hundreds of jobs. Um, you realize like okay, you can't keep Doing this. So at that point, like people would do some like this conversion into job DSL plugin and start to be using it. So that's I've seen the people today. Um, in the lawyer, I'm trying to push more people. Like, like you end up with these hundreds of jobs is because like you need so many jobs to do like seeming be like I say one pipeline. Having a pipeline of you know, the first class season, I think we can shoot down a lot and it can be the ability to create this common build process. So I think it's really just fair enough for most people. Uh, so that's like a tutorial and going forward, that's what I, I'd like to like rally more people on. But in any case, that's what people are doing today. Yeah. So um, the third of uh, what we are trying to do, um, the, the sort of effort to our state business is how to manage the like, depth of Jenkins itself. And involves uh, like configuration of the plugins, but the uh, things like that, basic stuff like that. So today, there's a this very successful shift and then puppet modules uh, to do these things. Um, I haven't used these things myself, but um, you know, the, you know, the, the puppet module, for example, you know, is done by the, uh, the capable guys. I trust that he's doing a very useful thing. So just to give some idea. So what this is achieving today, aiming to do, 
you could you could basically codify on this machine I'm going to deploy Jenkins master with this specific version of the plugin. Right. This way that you can wipe off the way that you lost the server and you can rerun this chef recipe and then make sure that this is the server tracking basically the same host. And the thing is like you know this is this about the field agents and other stuff. Um, this is why to see it. Um but um that um, so the part challenge when I look at this is like like it doesn't really go deep enough, uh, well, or it's kind of too much work to like support every construct of Jenkins. And you can, as in every Jenkins plugin, which is its own set of configuration, the puppet module for Jenkins tries to keep up with those. Like it's just not going to work very well. So. Like for like one, this is one of the efforts like I'm doing on the on the, um, and I hope you will be able to you be usable in in the in the field of one of the changes of that. We make some changes to the core to make this work really well. But you know what, the direction I'm trying to go is surprise surprise yet another DSL on the Groovy <laughs> to make computer systems. So um, you know and. Well, yes, yeah, so it's all Jenkins, but really, like, I'm trying to, like, like I kind of get, like, hide it for most people, most of them. So, if you wanted to see, like, a regular configuration file, so if you read them, they have to this point, I see that this is really not bad. You can see it, it gets this as a configuration file, not an executable script. But if you do things like uh, installing RPG plugins, or basically configuring the aspect of code, in ways that so the this, this system config cell actually doesn't know anything about this, what these keywords mean, but by so by using introspection on what plugins and what extensions the Jenkins are running, it could figure what these things are meant to configure. So you can you can it by design you can configure every little aspect of Jenkins. Um, and then the power of DSL comes when you're trying to like a repeat something or you. Uh, some of these configurations are driven from some other sources. So let's say in this case, if I wanted to create like a dozen window nodes, that's configure naming, like I can use these two things and have some variable substitution or whatever you might find. Okay, so that's where the core of Jenkins come from. So this way, um, so need, I guess it, a good trap, you still need the Jenkins war to be laid down by a chef or a the Jenkins internal configuration can be uh, left up to Jenkins to do it on its own. I can think of it as if uh, MySQL or Apache, well, maybe MySQL isn't quite the right example, but say Apache, like Apache doesn't, it's a server, but it does not have any configuration UI. Right? That's the boot, it leads up this configuration file and then it launches into the right shape. So, in case, like, if you think of this as the same idea, like I'm trying to basically get rid of well, I'm trying to create a story where the Jenkins does not have any GUI configuration. And it leaves this configuration file from the disk, and then it just starts up in that mark. It could be far more sort of like a regular, or more, more formal how people do, do you know, the make the configuration of the server. Right? That's the parallel I'm trying to do. Metrics based security? It's everything. Like, so this is like a, actually the mechanically generated. So, so yeah, so like uh, yeah, so that that'd be a great thing that for because like so you might end up with huge metrics. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so I I'm gonna have to add that to the slide. Good point. Um, Even if uh, uh, you can configure a Jenkins server and then go into the manage Jenkins and do save save export save, like export everything about that Jenkins instance. And yeah. So yes, I could. So we can. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. We're on XML now. So it's not the end of the world, but yeah. that's like. Right. But the, 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 the problem is like you end up overwriting, like you know, writing back every default value, mm -hmm. if you don't want to care about it. So and the other thing is, just like the XML, you, you're not going to get the same order. So it could be version controlling. Configuration might be here and over there. Yeah. But um, but I, I think your point is probably like you know I, I don't have to write this from scratch. If I'm given the empty text. Can I like type this up on my own? Is I probably can't, right? So that's probably your point. Like, you know, 
to people, right? And it's just a starting point. Manage it manually later. But okay. For, yeah. Okay. Or like a snippet generator. Right. I mean, right. like that alone, the yeah. pipeline, it you know lowers the barrier to entry, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So, so okay. I should I should think about that. Song. So far, what I thought about is I could uh, I was thinking about getting some kind of reference documentation, like I show that here on the JSON plugin. Mm -hmm. Introspecting the code, I can, I can, I can sort of scan the source code and see. Oh, in this slide, there is this extension, and here's the syntax you want to use, and stuff like that. So, well, don't major, but okay, this thing, like a senior nature equivalent. So, I, I think that people are kind of liking what this is trying to go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a good, <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's a good. Um, uh, I need to make a few more things. It's I like just record on this kind of fun stuff when I'm traveling, so like you know, I need to start <laughs> some more to be able to wrap this up. Uh, okay, so that's the uh, system configuration stuff. Um, and the next row that um, how am I doing? I know it's the next step that I next row that I showed was on that stage where we store the, the build record. So as you know, like today the, everything is stored inside this one directory that I can install. Um, I kind of like this that I could, as an engineer in like a one application team, I could plan, I could launch this, and then uh, I don't have to talk to the properly installed database to be able to do it. As the usage of Jenkins becomes very like a store in this critical information in the local disk is just not, just not cool anymore. So the packing of these things up is hard. Unless you have like a network mounted storage, uh, that's an expensive. You know, I guess maybe I should, since this is VMware, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you know. Um, and then the, or the sizing is, like, like if you're using local disk, like you have to add some disk, and you have to go out with anything to keep in place. Or, importantly, like if you're thinking about the fade over, being able to fade over the other nodes very rapidly, and then the state on the local disk. It's just not very amenable. So that I think is a is a growing problem. Um, but at this point, because there are just so many plugins, like assume these like a directory structures in which we lay out things and write information left and right, like test reports that's in one plugin, writing test reports in one directory, find bugs that's another plugin. Um, it's just, so we couldn't really like you know it's it's a uh, uh, a long and painful road to address this, but that is what I'm thinking about doing and hopefully addressing in the coming days because I think this, this pain is becoming more and more real. The general plan of attack, and I discussed this with some core developers in the project, is in a different sort of kind of information stored on the home that really benefits from, from like a different storage. So, all right, well, let's, let's start from the one, one area, one kind of thing. Let's say artifact, like a binary file. Um, and then say, so, so let's take that, and then we want to take like a, you know, design file. If, if you're doing scratch, so if we are doing from scratch, say, where are the storage you want to store it? Or artifact, for example, it's a binary file, so probably, you know, it's like the block store, like S3 or the Cinder or that sort of places where you're trying to push them. Um, and we want to just design abstractions inside, basically API inside Jenkins to be able to alert, like, you know, people so that users can choose to either store those on to say the proper Monday data store, like in C, or the local file system as a fallback, because we need to see provide other the compatibility and all those things. Um, so we move that into the core, um, then we need to work with the thing the both for us to like, move those over and make sure that the people are and this information through the API as opposed to assuming the standard structure in the directory. Then we keep repeating that process until like sufficient amount of things get to network. So we might be able to like really get to zero local disk dependencies. But every every shrinking every aspect can shrink the amount of footprint in the local disk, I think it really helps. The need to fade over four terabytes of data over needing to get over a hundred gigabytes of data, that's a lot of difference. So I hope we are hoping that by repeating it a few times over some of these spaces, we can kind of get good enough state. Um, and then the, the like you know, we can also sort, we can also sort of mark these plugins um, that correctly 
be using this new API. So we can give users some guidance, like so long as you're using this correctly updated plugin, you have zero local disk dependencies. Hope that would still work if you're really busy with it. Like at most, um, <coughs> the high on the hit disk, the artifact is the kind of the, like a big, uh, the biggest disk over right now. Um, and so we are thinking about you know, being able to push those over to develop the block store, like I just uh, described. Let's say that you get the unbounded capacity and also that you can get better bandwidth. So you key up syncing. Right now, these artifacts are stored by the same Jenkins web server that people are using practically. So it's going to compete on those. Um, any other company like, being able to recreate these artifacts across the globe so that they closer to the build is also important. So we can solve these things. Uh, this one that's been identified, I think, is like a build log. Um, you can, um, you know, have modern. So I, well, I think we are thinking about two things. The one is just to be able to store those if you want it. Three, like a block of like this three if you have a look of each. Then like a log stash or a plank or that sort of like a better log aggregation service. We want to be able to just stream that into there. And the old services do its own thing. And I think you get the better searchability, better retention of the information than being able to hide across the build and over time. Um, field records is, yeah, I think, is probably the next important one. So these guys, so um, we get ahead, we push into the database or document store, like Elasticsearch, like called that on SQL or Mongo. So like, you know, if you get to this, this point, then you don't have to delete the build records ever, so long as you have enough this. So I did have come up with this one. On my system, so I can fix it so like a straight in play. Um, but I, I think right now it's, it's really kind of silly right now is you have to tell people that you can't keep the Google records forever because it's gonna like you know it's gonna slow down and then eat up more bits. The key record the, the storage cost is really cheap enough. So so long as you don't have to like suffer in terms of the performance, the memory footprint and then the, the search speed, um, we should be able to tell people to just until like until you run out of money. <laughs> that's, um, <laughs> that's what the way of, yeah, trying to do. So this is very much like you know more for looking things. Exactly like ambitious work that we are trying to take on in the coming days of thinking. Um and then now back to probably like a more like a closer <clears throat> time frame. Um the space of the statement is the in the proper build environment. Actually probably have have been the one the earliest problem space that has been attacked. Uh, AKA, like, we wanted to spin up the build agents on demand from the non clean space and then use them for our and then throw them away. So uh, people have been doing this you know, ECC open stack of where so those are like a, you know, what I consider like a first generation solutions where like it actually it that it's launching up the virtual machine is like a multi minute operation. So um, the here mindset is uh, like it's just almost like auto scale grouping in a way. Like it, it looks at it tends to look at the load, look at the load on its own, and then just slowly adjust the capacity over like by increasing it or decreasing it over time. Um, and there's a lot of plugins to do with that. Um, a, um, you know, plugins, for example, exist in the community. And then I, I think what we're seeing is the second generation of Mainly these older built around containers where you can start a new incident in a matter of seconds, like hundreds of milliseconds. And like people started feeling like, okay, it doesn't actually make any sense to keep the build any longer than one build. This kind of mindset, like a Jenkins master, does not really have any build agent at all at any given point in time. And as soon as some build will start, it's going to get the new container to run just on that build and then it's going to go all the way. So um, this has been also going on for, I would say, maybe like a past year or two. Um, and then the, there is a plugin that exists to do this with Mythos, Kubernetes, and um, the, the Docker, which actually have a several different takes on it, but you can use this with the Docker Swarm or stuff like that. So things is well. Um, I think people, a lot of people are using this today very successfully. Um, and in this way, I think 
think you can obviously like you know, be capable of creating this handcrafted build agent. So I, I used to, like I said, I used to have a physical server, that physical machine that's used for building. So I have to name those, um, and I have to make sure that they are running like a right tool that so has like a puppet uh, design deploy. But really something uh, actually the CF engine. I have a CF engine that would be able to install the version the subversion and everywhere or the JDK or what have you. Um, but in, in doing, either in doing VM or by container, you don't have to do that anymore. I like probably managing these machine state things, like I puppet and that sort of thing. You can you can get the best space. So so that's what kind of where people are um, are today. But in the but in here I'm gonna pick my card. Uh, so we, I think this is actually more and more important space, especially in the large companies. That um, and this is I think clearly in the future. So we uh, we started putting together like okay we started thinking about this space and felt that the uh, the better way to solve this is kind of more integrating all these pieces into one coherent story. So we had this for the long time. We've been running things in sort of service called device um, that's on the public internet. Um, there, I have this. We have to run this massive number of engines, master is massive number of billions, and then you know, that's coming in and going at any given point in time. But talking to the larger companies, often they have number of product teams, and then they, they want to provide this. Thinking for the service to the rest of the organization, see that feeling what those masters are running or what the builders are doing. Get out of the business of knowing individual master intimately and uh, what build agents are configured against it. You cannot create a single elastic tool for building its provision. So, um, so we did it. I see some other like a big other company is like taking this on on their own selves. But the general idea is that like, this stuff is like a YAS layer that can create some, you know, the big function virtual machine. So that we have like a thing, it's like a, you know, this bolt run. So we, let's say we call those things as a big worker node, and then we have some brain we call the controller node. Um, so the way we use those is like we're going to divide up these big honking boxes into a number of containers, and each of them are running various different services. Um, like a one control brain of the cluster, we call the operation center as a, so this is the console that the, uh, I guess the administrator of the old environment is coming. But, um, you know, they, you might have like a six product team needing six engines masters, and at any given point in time, those six guys might be just talking to you running five skills. So those build agents is going to only also come in as a container and they run on the same box. Um, as the, you know, there's a control brain that here, that's it here to make sure like what's running where and you don't have to know as a, as a operator you don't have to think about where the master is running it kind of happens i allocated automatically so so let's say if you say that if somebody needs is like a new is starting something that needs to change this master so you can press a button on this node type in the name of the new master and it automatically find available spots and then that is the new master um, or um, there's a here. Uh, oh, I thought I had animation, but maybe I bought the uh, here. Say here, say for well, whatever reason, maybe this one container is lost, then the cloud is not that and automatically provide on that into some other available space. And the entire box is lost, and obviously all the containers are going to now be sparsely elsewhere. So, um, and then because now you don't know where stuff is running, stuff is running, so we have this like a writer component.
Thankfully, this is the direction I think where a lot of people are trying to go. Uh, we spent some time, I think, putting this together ourselves. Um, so we've been also this handle straight, straight, because Jenkins Master, uh, as I said, needs to store things in Jenkins Storm. So, um, you know, we might uh, allow you to put these data over an FS into, you know, something like a EMC filer. So, uh, or you could also do uh, the block stuff. If you're running this on AWS, we automatically manage the, um, the, the, the uh, EBS volume attached to these devices. So, you know, and worry too much about where the storage is coming from and the taking care of automatically. Uh, the agents are also from Docker images. So that's, you know, that's, it's kind of one, I said, as a second generation and elasticity in the ephemeral build agents is like you want to create this agent as a container and you run your building inside. You could do that. Um, it's been a kind of like a recipe ingredient that it, I think the modern people in large enterprise is trying to create the CI environment for. Um, but that's, I think, uh, where Jenkins project as a whole is also heading to. Um, and then, I think it looks like I was copying this wrong slide. But, so that's the deal. I, was, I think it covers everything that I wanted to talk about. So let's go back to that, uh, that slide. This key slide quickly to just wrap up. So, what I was trying to show, so there are like a various different axes of statelessness we are trying to push for. A number of things we have today that people are really using day in day out. Um, and then in the other, we are trying to like move this more. So the so that, that the struggle, um, the straight struggleability, like uh, the first effort is to our the practice, and that has started some time ago. There's some distance to go before we can wrap it up or, or complete. Um, and then this like a pilot code stuff. That's Jenkins file, GitHub organization folder, so that stuff is coming into the door. I think it's going to grow over. I know we're going to have to add those more things that I got uh, GitLab or packets, and there's a lot more simplicity what we're going to do. In the system configuration DSL, that's kind of weird. We, we could be maybe to do this. see those coming. The struggle stage work is more is the ambition for. And then in the meantime, the, 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 another part of, like, a part of that. Managing the entire cluster, so you take like, a command line that you can do, like you can add the new worker node or replace one and stuff like that. That's actually interesting. So, so yeah, we don't. And I, I don't know if it means both. I want to expose it means both. Like I want to be able to switch to Kubernetes, say in one version. So that's another part of Kubernetes. Do you have one that really available? Now? has done on the product. Everything else, all that pipeline stuff, I didn't talk about any of the properties. Well, the stage, when you were showing the job, the overview, and it showed the, it had the, the, the graph of the table. Yeah. When I was looking at that a few months ago, like, I couldn't get that stage view to show up. It wasn't in price only. It was in price only. Yeah. Two or three weeks ago, uh, it was open back up. Is that plug in? Or is it in the pipeline program? I still see those though when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Or even a second plugin released recently that's a different view of that that's super pretty, but we'll see what happens with it. Sure. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that was really nifty. So, what's that So, part of it, my pitch is like, in Kudo, I want to get out of this business of like telling everyone, like, this is the plugin you need to install, that is the plugin you need to install. <laughs> like, I want to. Yeah, that's true. Like, even for uh, that's five minutes. Something else. Mm -hmm. you would think you would use those items. Mm -hmm. Another okay. point is that that stage view is yeah. part of 2.0. Yeah, yeah. 
So like if you did it in this tone running it on one of those, there is indeed a plugin you can install. But I see it's just not it's just not productive. So I think all what we are trying to do is like as a community we wanted to create this set of set of functionality that we think is necessary for eighty percent of people. And that's it consists of a you know certain number of plugins. In the delivery as a basically like a one experience of this thinking. So all you have to do from your perspective is just thing. So we can't just jump to two Let's say we're stuck one point X for some amount of time because various bureaucratic processes prevent us from just jumping. The, the stage view you plug you didn't just yeah. 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 So yeah. be a pipeline stage view thing, I think. You need to fight the other battle against yeah. 2.0. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the problem is these guys have watched Andrew and I guess my presentation and they realize I can only run LTS. I'm only uh, on LTS. Uh, okay. so 2.0 is going to be LTS this summer. So you can always test 2.0 to help you pay. Test. <laughs> so when it comes out, it's that much better. Yep. The other security approvals and legal. It's an AWS. They won't care. <laughs> So what you need is continuous delivery for updating your software. <laughs> so with 2.0, there's a bunch of uh, plugins that are being shipped with Core. They're still plugins, but it's kind of install a, a sane default set of things. Yeah. So yes, I was going to talk more about 2.0 tomorrow, but the general idea is like, say if you install, um, I don't know, like a Ubuntu or a Spirel, like obviously that's like a whole bunch of packages, but like you just start with just a kernel and ask it to install everything else. So hey it's kind of hard if you tomorrow this like a well in, in case well it's like a two or three different variants, but still like you know you have a reasonable same starting point. Maybe like Ubuntu might be a better example. Like if you install the desktop, it gives you like. It's supposed to be some opinion, like, well, you need X and then the uh, one policy that they have that you face the compete. But have some opinions about what the reason for the stuff is, and they give you a starting point. And if you feel strongly, you can like, stop them out. But, like, if a new user like, just wants some function now, so then you can get it. You want to play a P3, you want your flash video. Yeah, exactly. You so, still want to use the tool. Right, yeah. So I want to get to the same point with the tool. So like you know, we we think that people are developing this. We can recommend what we do the best practices of how to do things. So that's I'm gonna make you start with that, and then if you if some opinion, you know, can remove those, drop them other ones in, or you can that's all. So have uh, some really critical plugins like the parameterized build stuff, um, and so it seems like some of the DSL bits. Well, I need that because I'm not building individual freestyle jobs anymore right. or as much. Yeah. So will that, like parameterized builds or parameterized build triggers or whatever, ship with 2.0? Or will that be available in case I'm clicking through GUI and still need to do it that way? I, I think the parameterized trigger plugin is actually in 2.0 because in the, in the, in the, in the fact that the, there's a lot of people who have like a shitload of freestyle jobs today. <laughs> and then they need parameterized trigger. And then also, like, you know, we want to make sure that the fact that people depend on our work and, like, work together. So part of the motivation of giving you that set is so that you can focus on the testing efforts on that particular combination. So I think it's in there. But if the new people are using that and then I think they find the parameterized trigger is just not all that necessary. Right? Yeah. Point, I guess, the intent is just, uh, kind of rose to popularity by its uh, ease of use and, like, Kind of easy learning curve of GUI access. There was a zillion plugins that you could chain together in all kinds of crazy ways and duct tape whatever you needed. Right. But in the future, do it properly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think there will always be a GUI friend because the devs, the ops, they want to just codify it, put it in source okay. control. But you're going to send stuff to, to product owners, to managers, um, yeah. or, or even looking in the future for working on, you know, Shine on. Yeah, a lot of other efforts. Today I'm only talking about stuff that's related to space. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about. I, I don't understand. Like, there's stateless, right? And you still need to kind of uh, uh, call it state, right? Let's say if you want to deploy to stage, for example, you 
trying to find reasons again why you would do that. Why would you do that? No, I could spot with checked in the no. no. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Bootstrap 
it somewhere. Um, with like stuff that was mentioned earlier, you can initialize, uh, you can seed a job, which could just be a GitHub it here. That which you must not do. That could be the one that he mentioned. We would, just the organizational poll we mentioned this last time, uh, be very interested in the good stash or plugin. As a, as a free or a low cost, not Squared Jenkins Cloud Bees Interface. Because the entry for stash is only 10 bucks to that company. You can't do it with that charity. They don't even talk about it. So, well, you're going to be really, really cheap about it. You're already entering the gift money. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. But you got to use the gift Yeah. You got to use the gift money. Yeah. <laughs> Because it happens a lot automatically, but when, I, when we use that GitHub, when I find that organization in that Jenkins configuration, it's not the hooks, and then it does. It does all happen automatically. Yeah. So you do that for often. Yeah. With the other. Yeah, it's really just it's really just using a it's very trivial. As far as I'm concerned, and then that's uh, that kind of like I do rest in the integration that's community is really good at. Right? Like it's a control system. Okay? So we did this, I mean, the C business awards and everything else was done by people looking at those and then we did the same thing for other SCMs. So I'm, I'm much hoping that the same thing is happening here. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, if you didn't sign in on the spreadsheet up here, I'm just trying to get a list of names and who is here so that when I expend the second for people, so, um, no emails or anything are needed. Thank you. I will take a look at this recording and if it's if the audio is good enough, I'll post it. Otherwise, um, is it available? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll get the slides uh, in any time. Um, but thanks for coming. Uh, that is monthly. This is the second month of doing it. We plan on doing it the first Thursday of every month. We did Tuesday to he was in town. Um, next month, I'm working on what subjects to do. So please get on the meetup board and start commenting what you're interested in doing. Uh, Cruz has uh, uh, just talked to me before the meeting. He's got some work he's doing at his place on database continuous <laughs> delivery. Uh, schema changes going up your database. Um, Be ready next month. It depends on his workload. If not, uh, just let us know what else you're interested in. Thinking. So, and, and obviously invite your friends. If we outgrow this facility, we'll find somebody else, somewhere else to go. Um, but thanks again for coming. Yes, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Everyone on the call. If there's anyone left, thank you for dialing in.